children. Grace and peace be unto you from our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that I thank God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given to you by Jesus, that in everything you are enriched by Him as the Word transforms you. So you won't be lacking in any gift. Welcome to the Master's Touch Master Class. I am your professor, Dr. Stephanie, and these classes are designed to give you a firm foundation in the Word of God. I'm going to take you from the beginning to your eternal beginning, in depth in God's Word, revealing His plan and purpose for your life, how He mapped it out, why He designed it that way, and into who you are in Christ, what power you have, why you have it, and how to operate in it as God designed for you to. You won't want to miss any of these classes. However, if you can't make it to the virtual classroom, then know that these are archived for your convenience. God bless you richly. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come into your presence with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts flowing through our lips. We exalt and praise you and your holy name. Lord, we thank you for the hearts and minds that are hungering for you and your word and to know your will. We praise you for our Lord and Savior, your only Son, Jesus the Christ, and his finished work on the cross on our behalf. Thank you, Lord, for revelation knowledge, your rhema word, and the gift of utterance. Bless those that have ears to hear, Lord, as you impart wisdom through your word. In the name above all names, the matchless name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Did you come expecting to receive today? You know, you probably get sick of hearing me ask you that, but if you don't come expecting to receive, you won't. You won't get anything from God. Elevate your expectation level. Come expecting to receive, and you'll come away with greater head and heart knowledge every single time. You know, we're moving deeper into the Word of God as we learn about being in Christ. And today we'll be taking a continued look at entering God's rest as we discover how we can enter into God's rest. Now the concept of entering into God's rest comes from Hebrews chapters 3 and 4. What is this rest the Hebrew writer is talking about? How do we enter it and how do we fail to enter it? The writer to, uh, to the Hebrews begins his discussion of God's rest in chapter 3. We're talking about Paul here, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and in chapter 3, he starts where he references the Israelites wandering in the desert and giving them the land of Canaan. Paul had pro Paul had, sorry, God had promised them that he would go before them and defeat all their enemies in order that they could live sh securely. <laughs> You'll find that in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. All that was required of them was to fully trust in him and his promises. However, they refused to obey him. Instead, they murmured against him, didn't they? Even yearning to go back to their bondage under the Egyptians, and you'll see that in Exodus 16, 3, Exodus 17, 1 through 7, and Numbers 20, verses 3 through 13. Now, the, the particular rest referred to here was that of the land of Canaan. Into that land, uh, into that rest, that land rest, God solemnly said the Israelites who disobeyed him would never enter, Hebrews 3, 11. They had been rebellious. All the efforts of reclaiming them had failed. God had warned and entreated them. He had caused his mercies to pass before them and had visited them with judgments in vain. And now he declares that for all their rebellion they should be excluded from the promised land. Our evidence is found in Hebrews 3, 16 through 19. But eventually, the next generation did place their faith in God. And by following the leadership of Joshua, they, some 40 years later, entered into God's rest, the land of Canaan. Joshua 3, 14 through 17. Now, using the Israelites as an example of those who were not resting in God's promises, the Bible further explains in chapter 4, making the application personal, both to the Hebrew Christians and to us, this. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. Hebrews 4.1 so the promise that still stands is the promise of salvation through God's provision, Jesus Christ. He alone can provide the eternal rest of salvation through his blood shed on the cross for the remission of sins. Now God, God's rest then is in the spiritual realm, the rest of salvation. He goes on to explain that faith is the key to entering God's rest. You see, the Hebrews had the gospel preached to them just as the Israelites knew the truth about God. But the messages were of no value to them. Why? Because those who heard did not combine it with faith. Hebrews 4.2 Some of the people that Paul was addressing had heard the good news of Christ, but you know what? They rejected it for lack of faith. Yeah. Hebrews 4.10-13 explains the nature of this faith. The kind of faith that enables us to enter into God's rest is a faith that first demands that we rest from relying on our own works. Yet, as we go further, the writer seemingly contradicts himself by telling us to make every effort. 
Here, listen to this. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. Hebrews 4, 10 through 11. Let's break this down now for complete understanding. What this apparent paradox means is this, that this kind of biblical faith uh, involves our submissiveness to God and our own efforts in that area. Though we cease in our self-efforts to earn salvation and the promised eternal rest, we also make every effort to enter that rest. How? By choosing to depend solely on God, to trust Him implicitly, to yield totally to the promises of God through the free grace of His salvation. Why? So that no one will fall by following there the Israelites' example of disobedience. Hebrews 4.11 now, we either trust ourselves to save ourselves, or we trust God to do that for us through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. By failing to trust God fully in His promises, we become disobedient and fail to enter the rest, which is eternal life, just as the children of Israel did when they failed to enter the promised land. Are you saying that if you get born again, you don't get to go to heaven? No. Listen to what I said. By failing to trust God fully in His promises, if you don't believe God... You become disobedient and fail to enter that rest, and that will see will cheat you out of eternal life because you won't uh, seek Jesus as Savior. Okay, that's what I'm saying. I'm talking to the the unsaved. So, how do we stop trusting ourselves? How do we place our full trust in God and His promises? Well, we enter into God's rest first by understanding our total inability to enter God's rest on our own. Next, we enter God's rest by our total faith in the sacrifice of Christ on the cross and complete obedience to God and his will. And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Unbelief, there you go. Hebrews 3, 18 through 19. Now, unlike the Israelites whose unbelief prevented them from entering the promised land, we are to enter God's rest by faith in him. That faith is a gift from God given to us by his grace. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. Now, the letter to the Hebrews weaves theology and practical application together. After each doctrinal section, it urges the readers to do something as a result. This often comes in the form of, therefore let us do such and such. Now, as part of that pattern, chapter 4 of the Hebrews begins with the word therefore, which means that the exhortations we read in chapter 4 are built on a point made earlier on. So our study of chapter 4 must begin with a review of chapter 3. <laughs> Chapter 3 tells us to look to Jesus because he is superior to the angels and to Moses. To make the point, he quotes Psalm 95, verses 11 through 7 through 11. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me for 40 years and saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation, and I said their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Hebrews 3, 17, 7 through, 7, 7 through 11. <laughs> He's saying, don't be like your disbelieving, disobedient ancestors. They refused God so many times that he set them aside and shut them out. In other words, don't test his patience. They're, <clears throat> they're, listen to what God is saying to you now. Now, to develop this point, he elaborates on the last part of the quote from Psalm 95, They shall never enter my rest. Just what is this rest, and what can we learn from it in connection with Jesus? And so we arrive at chapter 4, How We Enter. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. Uh, uh, that's chapter 4, verse 1. We can paraphrase this thought like this. God makes it possible for us to enter his rest, so we need to make sure that we accept his offer. If we don't keep our faith in him, which is the main exhortation of this book of the Bible, we will fail to enter. So, how do we enter? Verse 2 tells us, For we also have the had the gospel preached to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them, because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. Okay. The author urges us to be diligent. Then he talks about the gospel. Now this implies that we enter God's rest by means of the gospel. Remember the ancient Israelites had the gospel in a veiled form, in symbols such as the bronze snake, the washings, the sacrifices, and the festivals. But despite all the miracles, the people didn't have faith in God and the message didn't do them any good. 
We don't have to make the same mistake. Now we who have believed enter that rest. Believe what? Believe the gospel. All who look to Jesus, who have faith in Jesus, are entering God's rest. But wait, didn't God rest thousands of years ago? How can it be possible for us to enter something that is long gone? Well, the author deals with this by bringing up the objection, and yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words, and on the seventh day God rested from all his work. Verses 3 and 4. Genesis tells us that God rested on the seventh day in Genesis 2, verse 2. That is to say, he had finished the creation. However, he continues to work in the sense of upholding all things. But the author of Hebrews observes that God's work has been finished ever since that time, which means that God is still resting. God is still in his rest, and his rest is open for humans to enter. It was available for the ancient Israelites. If it wasn't, there would be no point in saying, they shall never enter my rest in verse 5. <laughs> So even though they refused to enter, God's rest was available to them. God's rest is available to us, too. It still remains that some will enter that rest. Verse 6. The offer is still open, and it's made even more clear and compelling through Jesus Christ. You see, the Israelites at that time of Moses, who formerly had the gospel preached to them, did not go in because of their disobedience. In verse 6. We speak of seeing our evidence in the word of God, and we can plainly see then that their disobedience was very evident, uh, was just absolute evidence of their lack of faith. They didn't believe that God would give them what, they, uh, what he had promised them. Therefore, God again set a certain day, calling it today, when a long time later he spoke through David as was said before. Today, if you hear this message, this voice, do not harden your hearts. Verse 7. Now, many, many years after Moses, God again spoke about rest, urging people not to harden their hearts and thereby fall and fail to enter his rest. David urged, hear him today. The offer was still good. People could enter God's rest. Uh, his rest could be secure in his promise if they listened with faith and willingness. All right, the author then eliminates another possibility for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. In verse 8, so the rest that Psalm 95 was speaking of was not the promised land. It was something that the Israelites, with few exceptions, failed to enter. They did not respond to God with faith and willingness. The author then concludes that there remains then a, re a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Verse 9, he's bringing up a new subject, isn't he? No, he's not. He's still on the same subject, using different words to develop it further. He's saying, since people did not enter God's rest in Moses' day, nor in Joshua's day, and yet we are still exhorted in the Psalms about God's rest, the conclusion is that his, this rest still remains for the people of God today. It is still available. Why does he call this Sabbath rest? He's not slipping in a command for the seventh-day Sabbath. Well, that would be totally out of context, my friends. His exhortation throughout this book is telling Jewish people to look at Jesus. He's not urging them to do a better job of keeping Jewish customs. The ancient Israelites who had the Sabbath did not enter the rest he's talking about. God's rest is entered by faith, by believing the gospel, verses 3 through 4. The author is not interested in a day of the week. He is concerned about how people respond to Jesus. A person who keeps the weekly Sabbath but rejects Christ has not, hasn't entered God's rest. We enter God's rest only by believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why then does he call this a Sabbath rest? By using this word, he indicates that this is what the Sabbath pointed to. Just as the bronze snake pointed to Jesus' crucifixion and the washings pointed to forgiveness and the sacrifices pointed to Jesus, similarly the weekly Sabbath pointed to something spiritual. Our rest through faith in Christ. It is available. We may enter God's rest. Don't put it off. Do it today. Anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Verse 10. God's rested from his creative work, but what kind of work do we rest from? What do we quit doing when we come to have faith in Christ? The work of trying to earn our salvation. The work of trying to qualify for the kingdom. When we uh, look into Jesus for our salvation, we quit looking to ourselves. Now the author again draws a practical conclusion. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by, the following, uh, by following their example of disobedience. Verse 11. Since the rest is available to us, let's enter it with faith. Ironically, this requires effort, not passivity. If we, we disobey God by refusing his son, we will fail. 
and fall. Why should we be so careful to respond? For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Verse 12. Now, just as Psalm 95 said, we must hear God's message with faith and obedience. His word contains both promise and command. It calls for our response. And as Hebrews uh, 4.13 says, Nothing is hidden from God's sight. He sees everything that we do and knows our thoughts. And we must give account. We have to give account to him. That's why we have to respond while it is yet today with faith in Jesus Christ. Then comes another practical application. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, uh, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Okay, again, the exhortation is not to a day of the week, but to Jesus Christ, our Savior. Here's the thought of the entire chapter. Since God's rest is available to us, and God judges us on how we respond, we need to keep believing in Jesus because he's the one we need. He became human, so he understands our weaknesses, but he lived without sin, so he can be our Savior. Hebrews 12.16 tells us that Jesus became human so he could save us humans. He had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. Help us now. Okay, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just like we are, and yet was without sin. Jesus knows what it's like to suffer and be tempted to, to, to quit, basically. He can, he can strengthen us if we trust him. We need rest, and Jesus offers us rest. And today, if you hear his word, believe it and enter his rest. Here's another way that we may enter God's rest, through the process of prayer. <clears throat> so often, you know, we look for a specific answer when we pray, but prayer itself is our answer many times. We often forget the process of prayer and trying to find the answer to the prayers. Through the process of prayer, we relieve our pain by casting our care upon the Lord. The process of prayer is healing, encouraging, faith-producing, and it brings us into contact with the source of all life. It is life-giving as it involves communication with the giving God. He is the source of all life. Now, Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30 says, Come unto me, all that you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So prayer is the method whereby we attain our goal of relief from our immediate concern or problem. How can we as Christians spell relief? We spell it P-R-Y. P-R-A-Y-E-R. -E prayer in itself is our balm of Gilead. Now, prayer brings healing to ourselves and others. You see, the balm of Gilead was obtained in a very small quantities from certain trees and plants. It was considered very precious, and it was used for medicinal purposes. Jesus Christ, the Christian's balm of Gilead, is the Christian's balm of Gilead. He is the very precious uh, uh, Savior to each one of us, and by his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5 say, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Prayer activates the power of God. You see, prayer is communion with the great physician who loves and cares for our every, every need and every being. It brings with it powerful rejuvenating purposes. Prayer brings new life. Prayer brings new life to our dead situation. Prayer ignites the flames of faith and hope in our hearts. Thanksgiving is involved in true prayer. You know, King David was a man after God's own heart, and he composed Second Samuel uh, chapter 22, verses 1 through 51. The word, uh, words of this song describe the awesome power found in, the, in prayer. David knew his God, and he magnified his name in this model prayer song. In this song, David tells of the great mercies of God to the merciful. He tells of God's power in delivering the righteous, and he tells of God's goodness to those who obey his commandments. Now, the Lord tells us that our labor should be, no, should be to enter into God's rest. And this sounds contra contradictory, but this is the only striving and laboring that is commanded by the Lord. We are to cease from our own works. Prayer is our labor of love, devotion, and surrender. It's the means whereby we can enter into God's rest. 
Now, the process of prayer in itself brings a rest into our hearts, souls, and spirits that produces God's peace and comfort in our lives. Prayer is the key to entering into the rest of the Lord, where we can dwell with the Prince of Peace. Hebrews 4, 9 through 11. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, for he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. So let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. We can enter into this rest from our own works on a daily basis. We do this when we place our total trust and hope and faith in God. Our faith comes from God who made heaven and earth, and he is the beginning of our faith when we are born again, and he is the end of our faith when we experience eternal salvation. Now, 1 Peter 1, nine says, Receiving the end of our faith, even the salvation of your souls. When we pray, it's an activity of faith as we are humbling ourselves before the mighty hand of God, and we are turning everything over to his care. In, it is an act of love, humility, obedience, and faith. And we know that our faith comes from hearing and hearing by the Word of God. When we study the Word of God, uh, He's able to communicate this truth, life, and the way to us. The Word is God, John 1.1, 1, 1, and His Spirit flows throughout His Word. Now, when we know how to pray according to His will, the Word of God will then be flowing in and through us as we pray. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, And this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Wow. So enter into God's rest through prayer. To enter into God's rest, our desires will be his. And they'll be his desires, as we have turned our own desires over to the King of Kings. The Lord's way will be, uh, will be uh, the best way, and we place our total trust in him. When we pray in this manner, it brings a great liberty into our hearts and lives as we are confident in God's wisdom and direction. Our own ways are unreliable in comparison with God's ways. For my son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding in all thy ways. Acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Proverbs 3, 1 through 6. So God can sa safely surrender, we can safely surrender to God all of our needs, problems, and cares into his loving arms. Isaiah 55, 5, uh, 9 says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Do you know that prayer is a tremendous privilege? The three origins of the ability to pray are all of and from God. And I think what I'm going to do, folks, is uh, I have too much information here to finish it up today. So I think I'll stop here and we'll pick up this privilege uh, the, uh, next time when we meet, which will be, this is what, Tuesday on, on uh, Thursday when we meet. We'll, we'll uh, talk about this. Okay? because I think it's important that we do that. Come on and turn red. There we go. All right. So we know that, that we are going to be able to take care of these things <laughs> next time. And I want to remind you that that uh, we have programs coming up that we need you to entertain coming to <laughs> because God has given us a great duty this year. He has added to us uh, the task of open classrooms over Skype, you know, and stuff like that so that we'll be in, in initiating. And I want you to know that so that... Um, you can uh, plan on it, you know. You want to, you'll be, you'll be wanting to come to these classes. So um, I'll be announcing them as they, as we get ready to employ them and and launch them. But first of all, let me ask you if you received anything from this today. You know, I pray that you did. And if you have questions or need further assistance with understanding any of these messages, you can 
contact me. I can be reached at masterstouchhs at cox.net. That's masterstouchhs at cox.net. Poet at cox.net or mthsprayer at cox.net. It's best if you email me because I am so deeply ingrained in back-to-back -back programs and classes that I have to check my email constantly and then I will answer you. But I don't answer the phone because I have it turned off during the broadcast. Uh, otherwise it rings out through the um, microphone. And I can't answer it if I'm teaching a class, you know, because I can't talk to you or whomever. So it's easier if you email me and I'll get right back to you. And I want to invite you to join us for the Master's Touch Master Class. These are here every Monday and Tuesday at 10 a.m. and again on Thursday at 3 p.m. And you'll enjoy a complete Bible College ministry level study on discipleship into be being in Christ. I, and we're going to teach you true discipleship into the body of Christ. Now, these are on a ministerial level, and yet they are for every believer. You're all invited, and we'll begin at the beginning of creation, which we've already begun, and move all the way into your salvation and the gifts of the cross given to us by Christ. You know, that's what we're doing here, and I'm not going to be repeating them. I'm not going, Monday, I'm going to do this one all the way across and all three, or, you know, I'm not doing it that way. I'm going with each one as a different class. So there, we're archiving them on uh, the website so that you can go in and listen to them. They'll be on Facebook. You can listen to them. Um, they'll be on the Master's blog, and you can listen to them there. We're not going to end up at our end, but at our true eternal beginning. So don't miss any of these classes. But you know what? If you can't, like I said, if you can't meet us with, with us at our time of the broadcast, we are archiving these classes on Spreaker.com and at on the masterstouch.org. So you need to go in at your leisure where you can study them well. You know what? Don't you think it's time you understood your purpose, what you're doing here? Come join us every Monday and Tuesday at 10 a.m. and Thursday at 3 p.m. And come expecting to receive. The Master's Touch Healing School is of Ministry is now also conducting worship services on Sunday at 8 a.m. on Ustream.tv. And they're complete services. But, you know, we worship. There is an opportunity for salvation. We worship. We have praise worship, soaking worship, the Word of God, Holy Communion, uh, salvation message. I mean, come and join us. Join me every Sunday at 8 a.m. Pacific Time on Ustream.tv for the Master's Touch worship service. And most importantly, come expecting to receive. Now, my brethren, Proverbs 4, 7 tells us wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. And that's exactly what we're doing here, my friends gaining God's wisdom. Therefore, make sure you're keeping Lord Jesus Lord of your life and know that the Master's Word is a subsidiary of the Master's Touch Healing Service, uh, or healing, sorry, healing School of Ministry International. We're a 501c3 organization. And I should say that the Master's uh, Word is the, it brings you uh, these programs. All right, so the Master's uh, Word and the this uh, uh, the Master's Class is a subsidiary of the Master's Touch Healing School of Ministry International. Remember 1 John 4.17, my favorite scripture, tells us that when we are in Christ, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. God bless you as you continue on in God's love. I just appreciate you so much.